بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ویلکم ٹو انگلیش فور فائن فور this is literary criticism and we're discussing Matthew Arnold this is lecture 27 in the series of Matthew Arnold um, we have discussed uh, formally what all Arnold had to say about criticism what was his theory of criticism how he saw the critics the role of the critics and what, what according to him was the function of poetry so Matthew Arnold uh, is uh, very different from the romantics because you know as we have discussed that he was initially uh, a romantic poet and uh, he was in the tradition of Keats. He wrote in the tradition of Keats. So he tried to um, uh, continue uh, with that uh, throughout uh, his life till the Middle Ages, uh, till he was like, you know, the middle, middle age, like 40-ish or something. And after that, he decided that he could not continue with it, and it was against his nature, and he decided to uh, uh, follow this uh, train of criticism, which was against the romantics, basically. He was uh, a romantic by impulse, but a uh, classist by, uh, by, its, by its nature. So um, he was of the view that the romantics, they delved too deep into themselves. They were all about subjectivity and thoughts and emotions and feelings. And they were not much about uh, the objectivity of life. They were not much concerned about how things were, actually. They were, you know, always uh, diving into the world of fantasy and, you know, searching their soul and searching their spirit and um, uh, searching the effect of nature on their spirit and things like that. So Matthew Arnold was against quite against that. He said that in order to provide um, a good criticism, in order to provide good uh, literature to the rest of the world, because according to him, literature was not a mean thing, it was not a small thing, it was something uh, which has a great purpose, and the purpose of the literature was to, uh, of, the, of literary criticism was to provide a criticism of life, to interpret life. If a literature or poetry, for that matter, has to have such a high goal, such a high purpose, then it has to have a certain standard as well. So that standard only can be achieved if we um, consider uh, the excellence of the poetry as well. Okay? Uh, the standard of uh, poetry has to be at excellence. If the standard of poetry is not at excellence, it would not provide uh, the right amount of the criticism and the right amount of interpretation towards life. If it's not the standard of its own, then the interpretation will be the standard of the standard of poetry. So for that, he said that in order to be a good critic, or in order to perform good criticism, you have to be away from, or you have to stay away from um, practical view of things. He believed that the best quality a critic could have is uh, disinterestedness. And he also said that you have to stay away from the historical estimate of things and the personal estimate of things. That is, whenever you judge something, it is either through the historical standards or through your personal standards. That is, if you are studying a poet or a writer, you will judge him um, as uh, according to his importance in the development of literature during his time period. Okay? That will sway your judgment, that will sway your criticism. Similarly, if, it is, if you're studying a poet or a writer um, uh, and you have your own affiliation with the writer or the piece of writing uh, that you're studying, you'll, it will, of course, affect your judgment. It will, of course, affect your criticism of that person. Uh, you will have your own prejudices and you'll have your own likes and dislikes. So this is the very reason he says that you have to stay away from the practical view of the things, not to be affected by the you know, mundane, everyday uh, uh, things of survival, like uh, there should be no political, social, um, uh, like um, uh, psychological, ethnic, or racial uh, factors affecting your uh, criticism. So for a critic, he has to be a very, very sound person. Number one, he has to be disinterested. Second, he has to be a man of knowledge. He has to be a man of culture. He has to know what the purpose of criticism is. He should not be the kind of a person who just read for the sake of reading anything at all. He has to know the best that is there. He has to choose for himself the best that is there and read only that, learn from that. Because, you know, literature uh, has this ability to uh, to survive through ages. Only the literature that is uh, that is good for the mankind, it instinctively survives. You just get that literature out from the, uh, you know, the value of the so many other books and poems written and you make it survive. It's instinctive in human beings. It's instinctive in literature, that sense of survival, that sense of extinction uh, would be there for those who are of no good to the mankind. Okay? 
अच्छा हमने यहाँ तक पढ़ा था वी हैव टू डिस्कस नाउ व्हाट अकॉर्डिंग टू डिफरेंट पीपल डिफरेंट राइटर्स इज द लिमिटेशन दैट मैथ्यू आर्नल्ड हैज बिकॉज ही हिमसेल्फ हैज ही हैज कॉल्ड you know a, a, a whole social group a, a whole century a whole era literary era was following him and following him completely he supposed to you know take a, a, um, performed a, a sort of a social reform people have changed society had changed लोग तैयार जैसे बैठे थे विक्टोरियन एरा में कोई कि कोई उनको कोई प्रिंसिपल्स बताए कि उनको रूल्स बताए वो उसको फॉलो करें तो यही मैथ मैथ्यू ऑनल के केस में हुआ है कि ही सेट आउट अ प्रिंस सेट ऑफ रूल्स और सेट आउट अ गिव आउट अ मैथड एंड पीपल स्टार्ट इन फॉलोइंग हिम उसका मैथड क्या था उसका मैथड था टच स्टोन मैथड ही सेट दैट इन ऑर्डर टू अंडरस्टैंड इन ऑर्डर टू एनालाइज अदर पोइट्स इट मस्ट बी कम्पेयर अगेंस्ट द पास्ट और वो पास्ट से कैसे कंपेयर करते थे ही सेड दैट वी हैव टू लर्न दीज लाइन्स फ्रॉम द मास्टर्स एंड वी हैव टू हैव द स्टोरेज ऑफ दीज लाइन्स एंड कोर्ट्स एंड डायलॉग्स एंड स्टफ फ्रॉम द मास्टर्स एंड वी कंपेयर वट एवर वी वॉन्ट टू कंपेयर टू दोज लाइन्स सो दैट वी कैन जज वेद द वर्क ऑफ आर्ट इज गुड इनफ और इज इट नॉट ठीक है तो इसको वो टच स्टोर मैथड कहता था अपना अच्छा इन सारी चीज़ों के बावजूद ही हैड अ लॉट टू से अबाउट यू नो प्रोवेंशलिज्म एज वेल ही सेट के हम लोगों को लिटरेचर में दर इज दिस हैबिट ऑफ फॉर्मिंग ग्रुप्स दर इज दिस हैबिट ऑफ फॉर्मिंग विच इज फॉर्मिंग पार्टीज एंड फॉर्मिंग यू नो पीपल यू नो टेकिंग साइड दर इज वन स्कूल ऑफ थॉट इज अदर स्कूल ऑफ थॉट वन स्कूल ऑफ थॉट इज गोइंग टू से दर स्कूल ऑफ थॉट इज रॉन्ग एंड अदर स्कूल ऑफ थॉट इज सोइंग इज गोइंग टू से दैट द प्रीवियस वन दे आर द रॉन्ग दे आर इन द रॉन्ग सो ये तो कॉन्टीन्यू प्रोसेस है लिटरेचर में तो कहते हैं कि प्रिवेंशलिज्म जो है इट मेक्स uh for uh, you know it makes the uh, literary criticism lose its urbanity loses its cool it makes it sound very cheap and it makes it lose its all decency because there is this politeness is this, this lack of politeness in this process generally kya hota hai ki agar to ye kiya jaye if you have to criticize other people you have to criticize in a disjoint detached manner and you do not have to lose your cool while you doing that you have to keep your uh, you have to keep your cool and you have to maintain in politeness so when you lose that touch of urbanity and when you lose that cool then the uh, literary criticism it erupts it 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 ends up in being eruptive and being aggressive the letter in the form of uh, the former in the form of literary criticism and the letter in the form of uh, writings in the newspaper so he believes that uh, provincialism also should be curbed should not be present in the case of criticism so let us discuss what all he has to say about um, uh, what all different people have to say about the limitations um, in Arnold's work Matthew Arnold was a man of letters of course we've established that uh, he was quite uh, well read not not as well read as other writers were um, uh, like uh, T.S. Coleridge uh, Samuel Johnson ke sath agar hum usko compare kare kyunki uske kitab isse predecessors to uske yahi the acha utna learned nahi tha but still he was a man of letters he was at the chair of you know poetry um, uh, in Oxford University so he was not a completely illiterate person or a jahil person or a common you know a common man he was a man of letters he was interested in the process of creativity and he was interested in the process of criticism he was also interested in the process of uh, poetry so he was a man of letters who became a literary critic by accident okay so we know that and we have established that all that this is a common pattern people who started out as poets and they have written poems in one fashion uh, following a certain train uh, or trade of uh, poetry they would uh, suddenly turn towards prose and then from prose they turn towards criticism uh, and then as critics they would try to prove that this newness of poetry that they have been trying to follow the world and the poets they're not ready for it uh, it was like a sort of a bitter uh, you know act so he is uh, not uh, one of the first who has done it so many people other so many other people have done the same thing so he turned uh, to be a critic uh, quite accidentally he was mainly interested in educational and political and theological subject he was towards this side he wanted to educate not only students but he also wanted to educate people um he wanted to educate uh, people how to appreciate literature how to take literature as an interpretation of life how to take literature as a criticism on life how to make sure that they are reading the right things how to choose that this uh, literature is good and this literature is not how to 
distinguish between the good and the worse literature, not the bad. How, how to choose between the better and the best. How to um, make sure that the best of the literature it survives. How to get the delight and the strength that you're supposed to gain from the literature. If uh, he has been successful in doing it, then we can call him a, a good critic. Because uh, he should be able to make people learn how to appreciate uh, poetry or literature. Uh, he was more interested in the political and theological subjects as well. Theological is related to religion. So his interest was not mainly educational, but he was more interested in the political questions as well as the theological questions. The Victorian era is known as the era of upheaval. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's known as the era of instability as well. clear monarch. There was a monarch at that time. Queen Victoria was reigning England, and she was a very successful queen for that matter. But there was uh, this uh, industrial revolution taking place. Agriculture was being replaced by um, industry. And as a result of this, people were moving from countryside towards the cities. And the cities, were, they were not prepared to take uh, on such a great uh, flux of population. So there was a process of disintegration in cities taking place. Slums were popping up everywhere. Uh, you know, these uh, people they didn't have enough to eat and didn't have enough to, uh, a good place to live. They didn't have warm clothes to wear. And it was England we're talking about here. And England is very cold, bitter cold in winters as well as in summers as well. So um, there was this breach forming in the society. The rich, they were getting richer because of industrialization. And the poor, they were getting poorer. So the society ki the manic rift create ho rahi thi, dono um, uh, portions of society ki dhamyan, us ek sort of instability, us ek sort of unrest society mein create ho raha tha. Aur phir ye ke, uh, jab industrialization start hui hai, to uske netije mein, there was a lot of raw material needed. And for that raw material, a lot of mining started. Aur phir bhoat sari small businesses रियालिटीज ऑफ लाइफ they wanted to treat they want they have realized for once that there's something's bad uh, something bad happening in the society something that was cruel something that was a mark on the face of england so they decided to address it all these social problems and reforms and all this upheaval that was taking place in the society at that time so they decided that we are going to take care of the talk about it okay to ye jo matthew arnold wala time hai iske baad ka time hai isme novelist um jo writers they were moving towards modernism more towards modernism Uh, then towards uh, and breaking away from the romanticism. Okay. Or is age me? You have to see that this age me feminism be start hota in a very beginning initial stage. Pe. Or this is the age where just me. ये ब्रॉन्टे सिस्टर्स मैंने भी लिखना था चार्ल्स टिकन्स ने भी लिखा टॉमस हार्डी ने भी लिखा सो दीज पीपल दे वर राइटिंग सो पॉलिटिकली भी ये जो चार्ज्ड एटमॉस्फेयर था तो इट्स नो डाउट दैट मैथ्यू आर्नल्ड वाज इंटरेस्टेड इन पॉलिटिक्स एट दैट टाइम अच्छा फिर इसी तरह थियोलॉजिकल सब्जेक्ट्स है तो uh, ये तो इसमें सबसे बड़ी एक्यूजेशन ही मैथ्यू आर्नल पर यह है कि ही ट्रीटेड क्रिटिसिजम और लिटरेचर एज ए रिलीजन ही वॉज ऑलवेज मोरलाइजिंग ही बिलीव दैट इफ अ पीस ऑफ लिटरेचर इज अगे against the morality and then it is a revolt against uh, life itself so for him morality and life they were one and the same thing one cannot exist without the other so for the sake for the, for the for the people who believe that it literature could exist um without uh, morality and on pleasure only this was a crude shock he believed that morality was to be present it has to be at the core of every literature every piece of literature ever written okay The few works of pure literary criticism that he has discredited are the byproducts of his genius. It's not that he was trying to produce criticism, um, uh, you know, intentionally, but there are some things that he has written that we are going with, with that we are studying. Uske essays, jinke hum journal um, uh, commentary, jinbe hum kare hain. So, ye jo hain, these were just byproducts of his genius. He had this genius. Usko kaha to ye jaata hai ki he was not a very scholarly person as compared to the predecessors we are talking about. But even then, he was a man of letters, and he has some stuff to say. And it's not uh, completely, you know, you can't completely ignore whatever he has to say. He makes sense at some points when he talks about disinterestedness, or he talks about, you. know um uh, people being um 
uh, staying away from the practical view of things where people being affected by their personal prejudices and biases and um, you know likes and dislikes and some things like that so uh, he 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 had this genius for uh, comparing things or for laying out rules or for pointing out a new theory so we can't completely ignore this so he has pure literary criticism uh, to his credit Oxford professorship gave him incentive for writing literary criticism though he was selected for this post not for his literary criticism for, uh, but for his poetry Achha, he has this uh, flair for poetry okay? Matthew Arnold uh, in romantics ke course when he was in romantics he was Matthew Arnold ke ekat poem included hoti hai. so he was offered this chair as an Oxford uh, ki, um, chairmanship as a chair of poetry it was for his poetry not for his criticism and he is not known for his criticism but people do like him at the present in the present state he is known as a good critic he is known as a sound profound critic this is evident from the tone in which he speaks of literary criticism he claims to write criticism literature for him was criticism of life and a critic had to be critic both of life and literature he believes that literary criticism is something that has to be written because it is a, a criticism not only of literature but of life as well so he is of the view that uh, life has to interpret a literature somehow and if life is interpreting literature then something that is interpreting literature is of course in turn um, er, er, interpreting uh, um, life as well so in order to interpret literature you have to uh, have a proper standard in order to have into in order to critically appreciate literature you have to have a standard a standard of excellence if they are there on that standard only then they would be able to interpret and criticize or critically appreciate life properly Pure literary criticism was not his forte. Whenever he speaks of literary criticism or the critic, he prefixed or uh, derogative or, um, and speaks of mere literary criticism. Achha, he was not the pure uh, literary critic. Okay? He was not there for the sake of it. Ke wo ki form ko, literary devices, ko, rhyme and meter, ko, um, or acts, kitne hai, or un acts ka structure, kya hai, proper hai, ke nahi hai. In cheezon ko discuss nahi karta. It was not his forte. It was not his job. It was not his speciality. It was not something that he was good at. Whenever he speaks of literary criticism or the critic, he prefixed a derogative and speak of merely. Uh, literary criticism so literary critic ko hata he, though he does talk about him but he uh, believes that he wants more to talk about literary criticism merely literary criticism ke mein baat karta hai wo. it's not he does not dwell into the principles and the rules and the regulations Arnold was not a scientific critic he was a much of a moralist okay? he was not there to you know analyze things scientifically or pointing out rules and pointing out principles telling ke ek hi stanza mein itne meter aa sakta hai ek line ke andar hi ambic pentameter hoga ke kuch aur hoga ya wo ye ki ye wala syllabus stress ho sakta hai ye wala syllabus unstress ho sakta hai yahan pe galti aa gayi hai jo short story tha uska construction mein ye fault hai is tarah ki baatein wo nahi karta tha he used to talk about the general things he used to give a general outline he used to philosophize Suffice, theorize. Okay? He was not there to, you know, um, give you exact outlines of things, exact way of doing things. The reason uh, for this is probably that he was not very sound himself. The reason for this is that he was not, you know, uh, knew much about literature because I mean, initially there were people who had doubts about his uh, scholarliness, you know, about his scholarship. People didn't think that he was that learned because they used to say that he ha he's commenting on the languages. Uh, on the books and the literature of the languages which he know nothing of and even though he's doing that so it was genuinely ke ek cheez aap par ke uske par ek journal sa comment de rahe it's not that you know much about that thing he thinks too much of the uses of literature and too little of its pleasures kyunki wo moralist hai because he focuses on morality a lot that's why he's um, you know talking about uh, the uses of literature all the time why it should be used what is the purpose of it what is the function of literature how it can be used but he's focusing very little on the pleasure that literature is there to provide pleasure as well entertainment as well to please people no he is not concerned with that um, that aspect of literature he is more concerned with the uh, pleasure with the um, uh, uh, preaching or the teaching aspect of literature this moralistic tendency in Arnold made T.S. Eliot compare him with F.H. Bradley. So T.S. Eliot called him, uh, compared with this writer F.H. Bradley um, and he said that just like Bradley he is a preacher a moralist 
Matthew Arnold was not a great scholar and much less a linguist. He built his political house on the brick of ignorance. Professor Sainsbury deplores his lamentable ignorance. So there are people who believe that he's a very ignorant person. Ignorant is not that he was a very ignorant person. When he was ignorant, he means that he was a writer who was a very sound and not a very sound. He had superficial knowledge of things. He had superficial knowledge of literature. He had superficial knowledge of poetry. He had superficial knowledge of criticism. And he had superficial knowledge of other languages as well. So on the basis because of that, uh, he, he tried to build criticism on the bricks of uh, his ignorance. He had much uh, to learn, uh, but he didn't bother to learn that, but he just started proclaiming you know, judgments without considering to improve himself, without considering to improve his uh, you know, database, his knowledge and things like that. Uh, he embarks upon criticizing authors and languages which he does not understand. His essay of uh, the study of Celtic literature remains overall a useless and stupid performance. People are very, very uh, critical of him when they uh, study things that he has written. Like when he has studied, when he has, um, you know, discussed two books written in uh, Russian and German language, because uh, even when he does not know these two languages. And he's written this essay on the Celtic literature. Celts were the original uh, inhabitants of England at that time. And it, it, he professes to criticize uh, them, but he does not know the language, the Celtic language, and he does not know much about their literature as well. But a general sa, uh, vague sa ek lecture wo de de tha. Um, ek journal se vague si outline si de de tha. Ek journal vague sa um, critical appreciation wo de de tha. Uh, lekin uske paas koi sound detail aur wo uske paas us, wo argument bhi nahi hote the apni baaton ko proof karne ke liye, apni baaton ko you know uh, kabool karwane ke liye. Uske paas he didn't have any logic. He had his own prejudices. So he, do, he does claim that a critic has to be, you know, um, disinterested and he has to remove, keep away from the personal estimate and things like that. But he was very prejudiced himself. His cult of classicism marred much of his critical writing. Because he was prejudiced towards classicism, because he believed in classicism and he was against romanticism. So this very factor, his influence, um, uh, his uh, love or uh, you know liking for classicism, it influenced many of his writings. It influenced many of his you know critical appreciations. So because uh, he would uh, negate a few things just on the basis of the fact that they were uh, deviating from the classic train of thought. His dislike of the romantic in literature was as much unjustified as the romantic's dislike of the classic principle. He li he disliked romantics. And he'll dislike romantics as much as the romantics they, um, I can't say the word dislike or as much as they deviated from the classic tradition. So both of them, if you look at the world, there romantics on one side and classics on the other side, there are Matthew Arnold's form of classics. So they, um, uh, just as the romantics were different from the classics, similarly Matthew Arnold is different from the classics. But he has this element of bitterness involved as well. He has this element of hatred or dislikeness, a strong dislikeness towards the romantics. God knows the reason for this. His method of criticism, the touchstone method itself, is not flawless. This method consists of selling poetry by the pound. Also, the touchstone method there, which we discussed, we said that we have to we have to know the lines by the famous poets or the authors, and we have to compare um, uh, different writers, whom, whoever we are trying to criticize or analyze. We have to criticize these. We have to compare these lines of these writers uh, with the ancients. Okay. So, in that way, Chaucer was criticized. He said that Chaucer, who was he's he's a great uh, uh, you know portrayal. Uh, he's presented a great portrayal of human life and um, he's, uh, he was good uh, when he was when he's written um, the Canterbury season is good now even at present and he's the kind of the poet who has this liquidity in his thought this is a flawlessness in his poetry but after all these things he cannot be compared um, uh, at the same level as that of the Milton and Shakespeare because he does not have their accent Okay. He then uh, moves on to criticizing Alexander Pope and uh, Dryden when he says that they are great poets. Uh, uh, no, not great poets. They are exact poets and they are exact versifiers. They create beautiful verses. They are exact, precise, compact, concise and everything. But you can't call them poet because their poetry it lacks soul. 
اسی طرح اس نے رابرٹ برن کو بھی ڈسمیس کر دیا کہ رابرٹ برن جو ہے اس میں بھی ہی ڈاز شو یو نو مومنٹس آف پیشن اینڈ مومنٹس آف میلنکلی بٹ دے آر ویری شارٹ لیوڈ اینڈ دے ویری انکنسسٹنٹ فار دس ریزن ہی کوڈ ناٹ بی کنسڈر اے کلاسک پھر اسے صرف ٹامس گری کو یہ اعزاز دیا کہ شاید چونکہ کبھی کبھی وہ اینشنس کو پڑھتا بہت زیادہ ہے تو اس کے وے آف لوکنگ ایٹ لائف از جسٹ لائک دا اینشنس بٹ اسٹل ہی از ون آف دا فریلسٹ کلاسکس یو کانٹ یو نو انکلوڈ as a complete classic uh, he was of the view that the romantics if uh, because they're my they, they, they're my contemporaries so if I study them my personal estimate is going to sway my judgment that is why we have to use the touchstone method and uh, we have to compare them against the classics and of course they will fall short so uska the touchstone method it was quite um, you know it was quite uh, full of flaws quite full of problems because you can't compare one writer to another writer every writer is supposedly an individual a creative um, a creative artist is uh, one creative artist is of course different from the other creative artist every person has its own creative process and you can't compare the creative process of one person to the other person so that's like you know selling poetry by the pound it means that you're selling things you're just you know ek ek pao ek ek pao karke aap cheezon ko bech rahe hain ki ek pound jo hai agar ho گیا ہے اس میں یہ ایک پاؤنڈ اس کا پورا ہے ایک پھر اس کے بھی دوسرا پاؤنڈ ماں پہ یہ بھی دوسرا پاؤنڈ بھی پورا ہے یہ والی چیز بھی پوری ہے یہ والی چیز بھی پوری ہے سو یو کان کمپیئر لائک پوئٹری لائک دس یو کان کمپیئر لٹری تھنگس لائک دیٹ یو کان کمپیئر آرٹ لائک دس ود ادر پیسز آف آرٹ ایوری پیس آف آرٹ ہیز اٹس اون ڈسٹنگوش پرسنالٹی ایوری پیس آف آرٹ از یو نو جج ڈفرینٹلی ود ڈفرینٹ اسٹینڈرڈس اٹ از ڈفرینٹ کریٹڈ کریٹو پروسیس از انوالو ان ایٹ He manifests a dislike of the historical method in criticism. ٹھیک ہے ہسٹوریکل میتھڈ یہ ہے کہ آپ نے بیسکلی کسی بھی چیز کو اس کی ہسٹری اس کے ٹائم پیریڈ کے حساب سے اسیس کیا کہ وہ کیسے ایگزٹ کرتی تھی کسی بھی ٹائم میں اس کے اس ٹائم پیریڈ میں کیا امپورٹنس ہے تو ہی ڈس لائکس اٹ میتھیو آنلڈ ہی ڈز ناٹ بلیو ان دا ہسٹوریکل میتھڈ آف کرٹیسزم فار وچ اٹ از ڈیفیکلٹ ٹو فائنڈ این ایکسکیوز Uh, why he dislikes it there is no excuse for it he does not explain it is true that too much of emphasis on the historical elements tends to make criticism dull and pedantic that is quite true that if you criticize something historically that is keeping in view the history of the work uh, history of the time in which the work was written or history of the author or history of the characters of the uh, novel or the drama or the poetry then of course it becomes a very dull and very uh, pedantic a very useless sort of activity but even then you can't ignore the historical criticism um, outrightly because history and the time period in which a piece of literature is created or uh, the time period in which the writer is writing the stage he was at life um, when he was writing that piece of literature that of course is very important yani ke a different writers different phases se guzarte hain different poets different phases se guzarte hain har phase mein unka creative process jo hota hai wo different hota hai different factors unke upar influence kar rahe hote hain so you have to study it from that point of view as well اس کا مطلب یہ نہیں ہے کہ آپ اس کو کمپلیٹلی اسی طرح پڑھیں گے بلکہ آپ اس سے جو ریلیٹڈ ہیں جو چیزیں آپ کو اس کو اس پیس آف آرٹ کو سمجھنے میں مدد دیتی ہیں ہسٹوریکلی یو ہیو ٹو کنسڈر دیم ناٹ ایوری تھنگ یو ڈونٹ ہیو ٹو نو دا یو نو ایوری ایسپیکٹ آف دیٹ رائٹر لائف یو ڈونٹ ہیو ٹو اینالائز دیٹ یو ڈونٹ ہیو ٹو اینالائز ایوری ایسپیکٹ آف دیٹ رائٹر لائف یو جوسٹ یو جسٹ ہیو ٹو اینالائز اونلی دیٹ پارٹ آف دا رائٹر لائف جو کہ اس پیس آف لٹریچر سے کنسرن ہوگا جو کہ اس کو سمجھنے میں آپ کی مدد کرے گا سو کمپلیٹلی آپ ہسٹوریکل ایسٹیمیٹ کو نکال نہیں سکتے جب کہ میتھی آنٹ کا خیال like we should completely do away with the historical criticism there's no point in it and it just makes things useless and um, boring but it's also true that all values literary and ma- moral are relative and the fact of time cannot be ignored you cannot ignore time theek hai har cheez jo hai har interest jo hai har value jo poetry hoti hai literature mein wo relative hoti hai wo us time period ke hisab se hi samajh aa sakti hain kuch cheeze jo kisi zamane mein hamare culture mein bahut bada taboo samjhi jati thi wo ab nahi hain wo values samajhne ke liye wo baatein samajhne ke liye kuch novels ko samajhne ke liye jinme un cheezon ka as taboo treat kiya gaya hai we have to consider those books or those novels or those plays or those poems in that context ki wo kuch zamane mein likhi گئی ہیں اس زمانے کے انٹرسٹ جو ہیں ان کو سمجھنے کے لیے اس ناول کے اندر یا اس بک کے اندر یا اس افسانے کے اندر یا اس پوئم کے اندر ہمیں اس زمانے کا انٹرسٹ پتہ ہونا چاہیے ہمیں اس زمانے کے لوگوں کا انٹرسٹ پتہ ہونا چاہیے سو ہسٹوریکل کرٹیسزم کو کمپلیٹلی اوور رائٹ نہیں کر سکتے دیر از این امپورٹنس دیر اینڈ وی ہیو ٹو یو نو کنسڈر ایٹ میتھیو آنل واز این ایگوسٹ 
and egoism is something that hardly makes for good criticism. A person who has an ego, a person who has the self-interest, who has this in self-inflation, that person can never be a good uh, critic because he could not put himself aside. He would not let his own ideas be put aside. He would always consider his thought process to be of great importance. He would always consider what he has to say to be exactly right. He would not be very much ready to take opinions from others. He would not be ready to, you know, listen to what other people has to say because he's an egoist. He would believe what he wants to believe. And he would believe himself to be right for that matter. So there's a strong presence of his own self in his essays. What he believes, critical in the process said, claim correct it has to be disinterested you have to be disinterested you should not have anything of your own involved in in that process you should not have the process of uh, you know self involved uh, in the uh, creative process or the, the process of criticism Lekin, uh, uh, this was something that he did not practice himself he was an egoist Uski ego it inflated thi ki he had himself in the essay all the time everything was about him um, not uh, it doesn't mean that he was writing about himself, but he was telling his own point of view. He was not point of view detached or uh, objective point of view, tha, yeah, which was not you know, st from standing afar and looking at things from a, a third party's point of view. No, he was involved in it. He was a party to the uh, process of appreciation, so he could not keep himself apart from it. His way of writing compels attention. He wants to have attention. دیکھیں جب اس کو ایز اے رومانٹک وہ اٹینشن نہیں ملی جو اس کو ملنی چاہیے تھی یا جس کا جو اس کا خیال تھا کہ اس کو ملنی چاہیے تھی ایز اے پوئٹ اس کو وہ اٹینشن نہیں ملی تو ہی اسٹارٹیڈ رائٹنگ پروز اینڈ دین ہی موو ٹوورڈس کرٹیسزم واٹ ہی رائٹس اٹ فورسز پیپل ٹو گیٹ اٹریکٹ دس از واٹ ہی وانٹس ہی از یو نو پیننگ فار اٹینشن ہیئر دس از سورٹ آف اٹینشن کیا کہتے ہیں سیکنگ ڈس آڈر دیٹ ہی ہیز واٹ ایور ہی از رائٹنگ از ٹو گین اٹینشن ٹو رائٹ سم تھنگ سو شاکنگ سو رائٹ سم تھنگ out of ordinary um, that people would get uh, uh, shocked or people would you know al get alert and look at you and see uh, for at least for a few t a few seconds or a few minutes or a few hours or a few days or months for that matter what you are saying but the thing is that Matthew Arnold is not that insignificant I might not like him and I might have things to say about him but he somehow has sustained so far people do follow him he's considered one of the important names in criticism except the fact in spite of the fact that there's this shallowness in him, He's, his scholarship is always, con is always questioned, his knowledge as a linguist and as a literature uh, expert is always questioned, his um, uh, uh, poetic ability is questioned, his uh, you know, discourse as a critic and his, um, what do you call it, his impartiality as a critic is always questioned but still he has the school of thought that follows him. So we can't ignore him completely. Arnold's egotism accounts for the high-pitched conversational tone. Um, he talks in the form of a conversation. His essays then in the form of a conversation. And they are a high-pitched conversation. Lerai ki tarah ki conversation uski hai. As if he's trying to, you know, wage war somehow. As if he's trying to prove a point. He's not telling people things. He's just trying to prove things. He know that he's right already. He, he does not have to prove himself right. He has to prove whatever he's saying is right. He just has to convince that he knows that he's right. The ripple of inspired extemporization. It is, you know, when you see people who are in love with their voice, they can't stop talking. People who think they're good, people who think they're intellectual, people who think that they have good things to say, they will keep on talking. So there is this ripple, ripple hota hai, jo samandar mein wo bante, daire se bante hai, tike, itash, jisko kehte hai. The ripple of inspired extemporization, extemporization, speaking without, you know, something written down. So this is, there is an inspiration in him to speak, to discourse, to talk. It all makes away from criticism because you cannot show off and be disinterested at the same time. Criticism jo hai is case mein, Arnold ke case mein, I believe it and several other critics also believe that your criticism has nothing to do with all this process. Criticism, it just, it just moves away from the entire process. It's, it's not there anymore. You're just showing off your own knowledge. You're just showing off your, um, your ability to discourse. You're just showing off your ability to talk pleasantly and intelligently. That is what you're doing here. You are not here appreciating uh, criticism, uh, appreciating literature. You're not here showing disinterestedness. You have become interested. And if you have become interested, there's no criticism taking place then.
There's much disparity between his practice and theory, he pleads. Disinterestedness, but is himself a highly interested critic. Okay, you have to claim that there has to be disinterestedness in a critic. But he himself is, a, um, is an extremely interested critic. Uh, interested critic means that you know, he wants to do things, but it means that he has interests. He has his biases. He has his likes and dislikes. He would not do things um, just for the sake of doing it. He, was, he would do it uh, for the sake because he's carrying a vendetta or some sort. Or if he's trying to prove something, if he's trying to prove him himself right and the rest of the world wrong. So he is interested, he's not, he's not unbiased, he's not unprejudiced. He's there, very much there, along with his ego and his, all his likes and all his dislikes. But all these defects are overshadowed by very real quantity to him that he did believe in the best. The best thing about Arnold that you can say is that he was not ready to compromise on the standards. He believed that there has to be the best which would survive. And uh, he actually believed in it. He always liked the best and he wanted the best to survive as well. So this quality in him was, mm, you know, very, very uh, reassuring. Then we discuss what, uh, according to Arnold, was the function of poetry, his theory of function of poetry. For Arnold, poetry must be primarily beautiful. Thank God he believed in poetry for being beautiful. At least he is not focusing on the pleasure part of it. But he, uh, he alone, um, he also could not say that um, poetry has not to be beautiful. Poetry has to be beautiful. It has to look pretty and it has to sound pretty. It has to charm you. It has to, chaya mane ya na mane, to jabu beautiful hai, of course it's going to provide, it is there to provide you some sort of pleasure as well. So it must give pleasure and that too of a very particular kind. Thik hai ji, he agrees. Ki pleasure dena hai usne. But wo pleasure kya hai, wo bhoat particular kind ka hona chahiye. Khaas tarah ka hona chahiye. Khaas kisam ka hona chahiye. It must give pleasure. He's not ignoring the fact. He's giving you two conditions till now. Ek ek, it must be beautiful. And second is that it must give pleasure, but that too of a particular kind. As he surveyed his own poetry and that too of his contemporaries, he marked a fatal omission, a quality of pleasure which he detected in the Greek geniuses. He says that in poetry, mein, not even of his contemporary, not only of his contemporaries, but himself as well. He says that we lack something. And what is that? There's this quality of pleasure which is present in the ancient Greeks, in the poetry of the Greeks. And we do not have that quality. We do not have that kind of pleasure. We do not give that kind of pleasure in our poetry. What has disappeared was the calm, the cheerfulness, the disinterested objectivity of Greek poetry. He believed that the Greek poetry had a calm in it, had some sort of sakoon in it, have some sort of, you know, um, restfulness in it. Uh, it was not all about action. It was not all about, you know, flow of emotions. It was not all about, you know, willing suspension of disbelief. No. It was, there was just a calm. There was this disinterested objectivity in it. Disinterested with the unbiased thi, poet involved nahi tha, reader ko bhi involved nahi karta tha, objective tha. Koi cheese, koi factor, uski subjectivity ko effect nahi kar raha tha. Na history ka di hoti thi, na personal likes, dislikes kari thi, na political factors, na social factors, na racial factors, na ethnic factors, na emotions, na feelings, na imagination, or na fancy. Koi cheese bhi is tara poet ki. Mm, disinterestedness ko, uski objectivity ko effect nahi kar rhi hoti thi. There was this cheerfulness as well. Cheerfulness I doubt, but, uh, but he claims that there was a certain cheerfulness about the Greek poets and the poetries. The real pleasure of poetry must be from a poetry which will appeal most powerfully to the great primary affections. Wo poetry aapko pleasure pachayegi, wo poetry real poetry hogi, jo ki aapki primary affections ko pleasure deegi, jo aapki primary affections ko um, address karegi, aapki primary affections ko uh, attract karegi. To those elementary feelings which subsists permanently in the race and which are independent of time. Wo feelings, wo emotions, wo faculties, uh, wo passions in saan ki. जो टाइम के साथ साथ चेंज ना होते हों, जो हर टाइम में, हर एरा में, हर एज में कोई भी लिटरेली एज हो, कोई भी मोनाक हो, कोई भी लिटरेली मूवमेंट चल रही हो, हर केस में वो जो फीलिंग्स हैं, वो पैशंस हैं, वो इम्पोर्टेंट रही हैं, और जो पोइट्री है, जो पीस ऑफ लिटरेचर उन फीलिंग्स को और उन पैशंस को अट्रैक्ट करेगा, उनको सूद करेगा, उनको प्लाज़ा पहचाएगा, वो पोइट्री है, वो 
real one. That would be the one worth reading, the wo that would be the one worth surviving, worth saving. The real beauty of poetry consists in its appeal to the permanent passions. Uh, permanent passions, permanent faculties or permanent emotions, the elemental passions in words with Katha. The real beauty of poetry is that if it pleases, if it if it if it appeals the permanent passions, if it provides pleasure to the permanent passions, your perma elemental passions, the only then the poetry is really beautiful. The poet's business is with inward man, is that with the soul of the man. So he's almost saying the same thing. He says that it's not the person who's outside. It changes with time. You dress differently with time. Um, you walk uh, differently. You write different things. You eat different kind of things. You live in different kind of horses. Uh, but the basic human being, jo uski kya kehte hain asal jo hai insaan ki, wo change nahi hoti. A poetry should appeal to that asal, to that real human being inside, the soul of man. The unity and profoundness of moral impression which the Greeks aimed is what constitute the grandeur of their works. There is this unity and there is this profoundness of moral impressions. Take care. Unki poetry siraf pleasure nahi deti thi. Unki poetry siraf elemental passions ko address nahi karti thi. Balki unki poetry jo thi, usme khas kisim ki unity thi. Is morality or pleasure ke darmiyan. They were morally profound and they also provided pleasure to the elemental passions. And because of this reason, because of this ability of uh, the Greek poets to provide or to convey these two things together, uh, that is why the, their, works is con their works are considered grand and their works have survived and they have attained the level of classics so far. Arnold is forced to turn from his own age because it lacked coherence and unity. Uski age concept was romantic ske time me tha or Victorian age start ho rahi thi, okay? So he turned away from it. He didn't like his own age. He he uh, looked down upon it and he criticized it because it lacked coherence. It did not make sense. It was not following a set pattern. It was not following any principles. It did not have any kind of unity. People were doing whatever they wanted to do. It was without moral grandeur. Because who could she preach to Nikaratha words, but na T.S. Coleridge could preach Karatha, na Keats could preach Karatha, na Shelley could come see what I with Byron B. They were all, you know, all about the passions of men, all about the soul searching, all about the emotions and feelings and stuff like that. They were not concerned about the moral grandiority of things. It was an age marked by spiritual discomfort. That is what he says. He says because you were not focusing on the moral aspect of a man, if you because you were not uh, uh, focusing on the spiritual aspect of uh, human beings, so there was this discomfort. People were not happy actually. People were suffering, and because the spirit was being ignored, because the morality was being ignored, and when morality was being ignored, life itself, according to Matthew Arnold, was being ignored. Life as it should exist. To basically religion ko include kar rahe hai, religion ko ignore kar rahe spiritually you start decaying, the process of degeneration starts, and when the process of degeneration starts, there is this um, uh, c complete discomfort uh, present in the society, unrest, upheaval present in the society. The discipline of poetry which Arnold recommends is Aristotelian in psychology and principle. In essence, Arnold places poetry directly under the control of will and conscious powers. अच्छा जी कि poetry कैसे होगी कैसे produce होगी तो वो Aristotle school of thought Aristotelian school of thought से believe करता है belong कर रहा है वो कह रहा है कि जी poetry create होती है conscious will से you have to want to create poetry and there has to you have to have certain powers in you certain conscious powers it would be under you under the control of your will and in control of your conscious powers you have to try to produce this Aristotle अगर आपको याद हो तो उसने कहा था कि poetry कैसे produce होती है poetry के कुछ खास factors हैं उसने कहा कि ये खास factors आपने पूरे करने अगर ये खास factors आप पूरे कर देंगे तो poetry create हो जाएगी उसने कोई ये नहीं कहा कि there has to be imagination there has to be fancy there has to be emotion present it was just an imitation of life जो नजर आ रहा है उसकी imitation थी poetry जो थी तो imitation करने के लिए खास process को follow करना पड़ता है उस process में of course you have to have this will to do it you have to have this need to do it you have to have this feeling that I want to do this and of course there has to be certain conscious powers कि आपने कुछ खास किस्म की मेहनत करनी होगी आपने consciously exert करना होगा कोशिश करनी होगी कि मैं poetry create कर सकूं from the ancients we learn clearness of arrangement, rigor of development and simplicity of style. 
he says that ancients are uh, you know a good example for us because we we, we learn from that, that their arrangement um, the way they have constructed literature that the way they have constructed uh, poetry it's very clear it's very organized it's very to the point and precise there's not much ambiguity in it Achha, there's a rigor of development things do develop there's an action sequence going on action sequence of course of course doesn't mean that it's a murder but it's a develop hoti hai. characters develop ho rahe hai. Um, plot develop hota hai. Hai, sequence pura develop hota hai, climax pe jata hai, wo anti climax pe jata hai. And there's a simplicity of style theek hai ostentatious style nahi hai unka unka style bahut scholarly or flowerly nahi hai balki unke style mein simplicity hai and these these things are the things which attract us to the classist the materials of poetry must be calculated powerfully and delightfully to affect what is permanent in the human soul materials of poetry the subject matter and the form of poetry it should be done very carefully the process of selection of the subject matter and the, that is the matter and the manner the matter and the manner they both have to be selected very carefully they have to be of the highest quality they have to have truth and high seriousness if they have truth and high seriousness only then they will be able to delight and they will be able to uh, give pleasure and they will have the desired effect uh, or the permanent effect on the human soul or wo, uh, wo aspects of human soul which are important hai, jo permanent hai, jo rahenge, jo the enemy of poetry is willful ignorance of severe discipline required for creation Achha. जो एक अगर आप वर्ड्सवर्थ को देखें अगर आप कोलियोज की बातें सुने तो आपको पता चलता है कि देर अ प्रोसेस इन्वॉल्व पर उसमें कोई खास डिसिप्लिन इन्वॉल्व नहीं था उसमें कोई खास ये नहीं था कि कोई विगरस एक्सरसाइज हो रही है होता है आपने कुछ देखा फिर वो बता रहे वो आपको ब्रेक डाउन जरूर करके दे रहे हैं कि प्रोसेस ऑफ पोइट्री इस तरह क्रिएट हो रहा है लेकिन वो आपको ये नहीं बता रहा कि यू हैव टू डिसिप्लिन योर सेंसेस और यू हैव टू डिसिप्लिन योर सोल एंड यू हैव टू डिसिप्लिन योर वेल एंड यू हैव टू डिसिप्लिन योर पैशन आनल्ड कहता है कि देर इज अ प्रोसेस ऑफ डिसिप्लिन इन वॉल्ड इफ यू नॉट डिसिप्लिन इन ऑफ दैन दिस प्रोसेस ऑफ पोइट्री और दिस प्रोसेस ऑफ क्रिएटिविटी वुड नॉट टेक्स प्लेस द एनमी ऑफ पोइट्री इज अ विलफुल इग्नोरेंस इट्स इट दैट यू इग्नोर दिस फैक्ट विलफुली अपनी मर्जी से आप इसको इग्नोर करते हैं ऑफ अ सवेयर डिसिप्लिन रिक्वायर्ड फॉर क्रिएशन यू रिक्वायर सवेयर डिसिप्लिन फॉर क्रिएशन यू हैव टू बी ऑर्गेनाइज यू हैव टू ऑर्गेनाइज योर फैकल्टीज यू हैव टू मेक योर फैकल्टीज वर्क ठीक है आपकी एबिलिटीज फैकल्टीज इन यूज आएंगी इन प्रोग्रेस होंगी तो फिर ही कोई प्रोसेस ऑफ क्रिएटिविटी हो सकता है उसके बगैर क्रिएशन नहीं हो सकती Arnold singles out intellectual maturity as the supreme mark of a great culture. When a culture has reached its apogee, when it's reached its maximum uh, uh, point of uh, maturity, then you have intellectual maturity as well. जब culture mature हो जाता है, तो आप ज़िहनी तौर पे भी mature हो जाते हैं. आपकी intellectual development पूरी हो जाती है. So he says that intellectual maturity signals out that a culture, जो है, एक civilization, जो है, एक society, जो है, वो अपनी extreme पे पहुँच चुकी है development की. तो उस सोसाइटी से आप एक्सपेक्ट कर सकते हैं कि वो कोई अच्छी प्रोसेस ऑफ क्रिएटिविटी को कंटिन्यू रखेगी इट इज द टेंडेंसी टू ऑब्जर्व फैक्ट्स विद अ क्रिटिकल स्पिरिट टू सर्च फॉर द लॉ नॉट टू वैंडर अमंग देम एट रैंडम टू जज बाय द रूल ऑफ रीजन एंड नॉट बाय इम्पेल्स इट इज द टेंडेंसी टू ऑब्जर्व फैक्ट्स विद अ क्रिटिकल स्पिरिट ये एक टेंडेंसी है होनी चाहिए सोसाइटीज के अंदर सोसाइटीज को चाहिए पीपल हु वांट टू स्टडी लिटरेचर दे शुड हैव दिस टेंडेंसी टू ऑब्जर्व द फैक्ट्स ठीक है और वो फैक्ट्स को जितनी चीजें हैं जो नॉलेज है उनके सामने उसको ऑब्जर्व करें उसको क्रिटिकल स्पिरिट से ऑब्जर्व करें ठीक है सर्च फॉर द लॉ नॉट टू अपना प्रिंसिपल बनाएंगे ना उसके लिए उन्होंने बहुत सी चीजें पढ़नी होंगी वो बहुत सी चीजें जो पढ़ेंगे डिसिप्लिन तरीके से पढ़ेंगे सो दैट दे कैन फाइंड आउट दे ओन लॉज सो दैट दे कैन फाइंड आउट दे ओन प्रिंसिपल्स बट दिस सर्च फॉर लॉ एंड प्रिंसिपल शुड नॉट बी लाइक एन एमलेस वॉन्ड्र इट शुड बी अ प्रॉपर प्रोसेस इट शुड हैव अ प्रॉपर यू नो हाइपोथिस पूरा साइंटिफिकली होना चाहिए एक प्रॉपर हाइपोथिस होगा उसको आप टेस्ट आउट करेंगे एक्सपेरिमेंट डाटा कलेक्शन करेंगे एक्सपेरिमेंट होगा और फाइनली आप एक रिजल्ट पे पहुंचेंगे ठीक है Uh, it should not be done at random to judge by the rule of reason and not by the impulse whatever you have to judge has to be judged by reason it's not by impulse that whether you like something or you not, you don't like something ki mere dil ko lag gaye mere dil ko nahi laga ye baat nahi hai aapke reason ko lagna chahiye aapke dimag ko wo baat samajhani chahiye agar aapke dimag ko wo baat appeal kar rahi hai to aapki reason ko wo baat appeal kariye aapki logic ko wo baat appeal kariye wo principle appeal kare to wo principle exist karega 
वो प्रोसेस ऑफ क्रिएटिविटी एग्जिस्ट करेगा जो चीज आपकी इम्पल्सिवली आप करेंगे वो चीज जो है वो किसी भी मच्योर सोसाइटी के मच्योर माइंड की या क्रिटिकल स्पिरिट का जो सर्च है उसके लिए हार्मफुल होगी आनंद क्लियरली वॉन्ट्स टू इस्टेब्लिश अ बेसिस ऑफ इंटेलेक्चुअल डिसिप्लिन फॉर द पोइट विदाउट दिस कॉन्शियस डिस्पोजिशन ऑफ ऑर्डर अपॉन हिज मटीरियल द पोइट इज कैप्ट फ्राम द हाई सक्सेस ऑफ हिज आर्ट अच्छा ही वॉन्ट्स टू फॉर्म दिस इंटेलेक्चुअल डिसिप्लिन फॉर द पोइट ठीक है ही वॉन्ट्स टू ले आउट एंड आउट लाइन कि दिस इज हाउ यू हैव यू सपोज टू डिसिप्लिन यूर माइंड दिस इज हाउ यू सपोज टू डिसिप्लिन यूर प्रोसेस ऑफ थिंकिंग एंड यूर प्रोसेस ऑफ क्रिटिसाइजिंग एंड यूर प्रोसेस ऑफ एनालाइजिंग थिंग्स ही वॉन्ट्स टू डू इट वेरी बैडली बट he wants to do it without conscious disposition of water it should not be done consciously it should not be you know forced upon the poet it should something that should come naturally is tarah hona chahiye itni cheeze padhni chahiye itna exposed hona chahiye poets ko ki wo automatically ye discipline apne andar inculcate kar le uh, it should not be done forcefully on the material of the poet if it is kept from the high success of the art if it is not done so um without this conscious disposition of order upon his materials the poet is kept from the high success of his art agar wo apne aap ko discipline nahi karega na apne intellectual process mein ya apne uh, analytical uh, ability mein ya apne creative process mein to wo maximum success jo hai wo achieve nahi kar sakta jitna uska potential tha utne potential ko wo apne pahunch nahi sakega agar wo apne aap ko organize nahi karega agar wo apne aap ko discipline nahi karega to ye process uska kabhi bhi pura nahi hoga uski jo maximum uh, the ability wo usko uh, nahi istemal nahi kar sakega for anil the poet must possess a rare combination of knowledge penetration and seriousness along with the sensitive soul poet ke andar ye qualities honi chahiye uske andar knowledge hona chahiye he should be able to penetrate in the soul he should be able to dig deep he should be able to see deep he should have this depth shallow nahi hona chahiye there has to be certain seriousness and there has to be a sensitive soul wo khali aam sa aadmi nahi hoga he has all these qualities he would be serious he would be knowledgeable he would be deep he would be um, you know sensitive uh, and he should be serious as well so the power of quick and strong perception and emotion is perhaps the positive constituents of poetic genius he has to be quick and strong foreign reaction hoga koi cheez perceive karni hai to wo foreign perceive karega slow or dull nahi hoga aur uski emotion jo hai wo immediately respond karenge to ye jo hai sabse positive constituent hai kisi bhi poet ki personality ka sensibility gives genius its materials unki senses sharp hone chahiye yahi baat wo sath ne ki thi ki jo poets hain they also have organic sensibility but their organic sensibility is little more a little sharper than the usual person theek hai so he says ke poet has to have these qualities a poet has to um, have this combination of knowledge penetration seriousness along with sensitive soul and he has to have this we can strong perception and emotion uh, and he has to have sensibility which would of course the basis of all the uh, genius that he has he tried very carefully to balance the claims of all of man's faculties in the poetic process theek hai he says ke jaise usne kaha tha na ki ye bahut hi important process hai isme sare jo soul aapka involve hota hai sari faculties jo hai wo involve hoti hai so this process has to uh, take place in a balance all the things should uh, exist in harmony there so poetry must be brought to serve certain ends uh, um, is ka matlab hai ki poetry ka koi khas function hona chahiye kuch khas achievement usne karni hai isi wajah se aap itni sari cheezon ko discuss kar rahe hai na ki poet ki personality mein ye hona chahiye aur jo process so us pe ye sab kuch hona chahiye aur jo critic usko appreciate kar raha hai uski personality mein ye kuch hona chahiye it can only do so by being a combination of conscious will and vital soul you have to have something inside you if you don't have that something inside you you cannot be a good poet you cannot create poetry but if you have something inside you and you do not want to you do not have the will to do it then again poetry would not be created so there has to be this combination of conscious will and vital soul poetry must be beautiful it must give pleasure so arnold's concept of useful is inherent in this total effect this is how he thinks useful kya hoga jo ke ye sara kuch kar de theek hai useful poetry kaun si hogi poetry ka function kya hai it has to be useful na yahi hum prove karne ki koshish kare poetry useful wo hogi jisme insaan ki sari faculties balance mein hongi poetry wo useful hogi jo kuch khaas kisam ke ends ko achieve kar sakti ho it should be a combination of vital uh, soul and conscious will and it should be beautiful and it should give pleasure theek okay? hai if all this is done if all this effect is achieved then of course it is useful so this is all that arnold has to say about poetry the function of poetry and the function of critic 
This is the end of Matthew Arnold, and the next critic we're going to start is uh, T.S. Eliot. Um, Eliot uh, is uh, a traditionalist, basically. He is uh, very different uh, from the rest of the uh, critics that we have studied. He would believe uh, he's going to tell you to stick to the past continuously. Like, you know, stick to the past is very different. He believes that things have to be taken traditionally. Things have to be treated traditionally. You can't ignore the past completely. But it does not mean that you have to stick to the past completely as well. He is, um, you know, of the same school of thought as Matthew Arnold, but different as well. So the next time we meet, we are going to discuss T.S. Eliot and his theory of uh, tradition and individual talent. So till we next meet, this is the end of Matthew Arnold.